Let's turn to Jude, chapter 1. Jude, chapter 1. There's only one chapter in it, but... Verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful, it was important, it was mandatory for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. This verse speaks loudly to us who love the truth. And if this warning was necessary back in the first century, where are we now? After all that's transpired, the church has lost a lot. But even though that was the case, and even though it was weakened by inaccuracy, the Christian message was profound enough to change the world. Those who believed before us have passed their faith on to us, and sometimes through extremely difficult and unbelievable circumstances. And their devotion and their efforts and their sacrifices built the foundation for our faith, which we now freely practice and enjoy. We owe so much to those heroes who died for their Christian faith to preserve it or to reform it. And every day we can open our Bibles and freely believe God and practice our faith. We ought to breathe a prayer of thanks to God for those people because their teachings still reverberate today, not only in what we believe, but also in our politics and in our society. But the Reformation is not over. It's incomplete. The rest of the faith that was once delivered unto the saints is still in God's Word, and we can work the Word and rediscover it. The downfall of the first century church was caused by two events. The first event was that Paul went to Jerusalem against God's wishes and got arrested and was in jail for four years. And that basically took apart the Gentile church. In Philippians chapter 1, we can see where some people were taking advantage of this situation. Philippians chapter 1, verse 15, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some of goodwill. So people were taking advantage of his being in jail and, you know, he tried to direct some of the affairs from jail, but barely a year after Paul was released, the Roman Emperor Nero began persecuting Christians, and this prevented him from repairing the damage. Then in 70 AD, the other side of the church, the Judean side of the church, fell apart when Jerusalem was attacked by Titus and the temple was destroyed. And so when that occurred, the Judean Christians lost their headquarters, and that side of the church never regained the same influence, and it, in the end, was probably absorbed by the Gentile side of the church. In 1 Peter 4, Peter warned them of what was coming. Verse 12, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. He saw what was coming. Because of this, and because people took advantage of the situation, there was no central leadership to make sure that error didn't creep in. Because you have to have some structure. The body of Christ is not an amoeba. There has to be some structure, not to the point where it impedes the movement of the spirit, but you have to have some structure. You have to have some place where people can come to get trained. You have to have something like that where resources can be focused and then shared. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, they turn to myths and endless genealogies. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, they started teaching the law. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 19, they were doing things that were against the household of faith. They started teaching doctrines of devils and forbidding to marry or eat meat. In 2 Timothy 1 19, all Asia, and that's Asia Minor, had turned against Paul. In 2 Timothy 2.10, people were teaching that the resurrection had passed. And Titus 1, uh, they were teaching circumcision and Jewish myths in the church. And it was because the leadership had gotten weakened, the church had gotten splintered. And then after that came the warning of Jude, that they should earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. And in the writings of the second century, the church fathers, we can absolutely see that the mystery was lost. They didn't even mention it. The hope they didn't mention it, or they, they had twisted it into something different. 
the manifestation of Holy Spirit were rejected. There was no power. Salvation by grace was replaced by salvation by works. And so these things were lost and they would have to be won back in blood. Thirteen and a half centuries later, Erasmus laid that egg that Luther hatched by making the Greek version of the Bible available in printed form and encouraging people to translate from it into their native tongues. That was very radical because at that point the Bible was entombed in Latin. It, that was the language of priests and scholars. It wasn't spoken of the common man. All translations were banned and the, it was a death penalty if you owned any other kind of Bible other than a Latin Vulgate. The church dominated all aspects of European culture and the ecclesiastical hierarchy had been in control for so long they didn't care anymore. They were so arrogant, corruption was so rampant and hypocrisy, and they didn't try to hide it anymore because they'd been in control for so long. And reform was desperately needed. It was just immense. Many brave believers tried and died to try to reform. And no one will ever know how many there were because they, they just erased them from history. And all they had was just a little scrap of light, nothing compared with what's available today. But they were branded hair picks and they, were, they died horribly. They were burned at the stake, burned alive. But people still tried because the word was so compelling. It was so healing when even a little scrap of light that people did receive, blessed them so much they wanted more. And some people finally succeeded. And of those people who finally succeeded, there were five traits of the successful emergence of these reformers. And these are the heroes of the Reformation. And in every case, their efforts revolved around translating the Bible into the languages of the common people. The first one was John Wycliffe, and we're going to center mainly on the English side of things, but because <clears throat> there were many more. John Wycliffe was a believer in England who lived from 1324 to 1384 before Martin Luther. He's called the Morning Star of the Reformation, and he was born at the right place at the right time to make these spiritual advances. At the same time, Marco Polo was making his journey to China. Uh, England was on the rise. Oxford University was gaining recognition as a center of learning in Europe. The Greek manuscripts existed, but they were tucked away in archives, forgotten in libraries. More than one-third of the country of England was owned by the Roman Catholic Church, and vast sums of money were being channeled into the Vatican through rents and gifts and taxes, contributions, indulgences, and the Pope was extremely powerful, more powerful than kings and queens. What he said had more weight than what the Bible said, the Pope. When Wycliffe was either 13 or 15, he was sent to Oxford University, and he was a brilliant student. Uh, later he became known as the Flower of Oxford, and he had some instructors there that encouraged him to pursue studying the Bible. And they held views that were against the corruption of the church at that time. And so this is the first trait of those who were successful. There was light from God's word in their life. Then in 1348, the bubonic plague hit Europe, and that was just terrible. One third of the people in Europe died. Can you imagine living through something like that? Just unbelievable. And they didn't know what caused it. They didn't know what germs were. They didn't know where it came from. So Wycliffe thought the world was ending. And so he took refuge studying the Bible. And this is the second trait that was in common with all these people, is that there was a hungry heart to learn the truth. And at that time, because of all the upheaval and people were wondering, is it something we're doing wrong? There was such spiritual hunger at that time because they thought that they had sinned and, and this is why the, all these people were dying and, and all this terrible stuff was happening. So four 
orders of monks started spreading across Europe. The Dominican, the Franciscan, the Augustinian, and the Carmelite orders. They just swarmed all over Europe and they competed with one another to get converts and to get contributions. And as their competition intensified, they got to the place where they were willing to do anything, promise anything, to get more converts. I mean, even unethical, immoral things. Anything. And when they arrived at Oxford, they recruited so many of the students that the parents stopped sending their kids to Oxford. That and the bubonic plague had caused attrition in the student population, and so Wycliffe started denouncing these begging friars because of their greed and hypocrisy and corruption, and he stood up against them. And because he did that, the people at the university said, hey, boy, this is great. He's helping us out. He's standing against these people who are doing this terrible stuff to our university. And so he earned his doctorate in divinity at that time and began the lecture on the Bible at the college. Now, across the channel in France, France began taxing the church, believe it or not, because they, they, were, they were trying to get money any way they could. And so this brought the Pope and King Philip of France into direct contention. The Pope forbade the taxation of any part of the church without permission from Rome. And King Philip retaliated by cutting off all church funds from leaving France. He said, you can't take it with you. And so the situation spiraled out of control. The Pope excommunicated a whole bunch of French people. And uh, finally, a French army captured the Pope and beat him up so bad that he died a month later. Just unbelievable. And the next Pope only lived eight months. And when he died, then there was a contention over the succession. And part of the Roman Catholic Church kept Popes in Rome, and the other part had a second Pope, a competing half of the Roman Catholic Church, where the, their Pope was in France. And for 70 years about, there was this schism in the Roman Catholic Church, and they were fighting each other. And this characterizes the third trait of those who succeeded in breaking through and making re reform, and that is that there was a space of grace. In other words, the people in the Roman Catholic Church were so busy contending with each other that they couldn't stamp out Wycliffe. They couldn't stop him from doing what they were doing because they were concentrating all their resources on defeating each other. So there was a space of grace. Also at this time, in 1339, the Hundred Years' War began. This is a war between England and France. It went on and off for over 100 years. In uh, 1346, England gained the upper hand, and it was tired of the taxation of the church, so England stopped paying their rents and their taxes and their indulgence money and everything to the Roman Catholic Church because they knew that if they did pay it, it would be turned right around and given to the Pope in France to finance the French army against England. So they knew that if they gave to the church, it was just gonna turn around and finance the war against them. Because Wycliffe gained fame in England because he stood up against all these begging friars, the politicians in England asked Wycliffe to assist them in resisting the Pope in Rome. And so he became part of a delegation and spoke up against all the oppression of the Roman Catholic Church, and he actually declared that the Pope was Antichrist. That was just unbelievable to be able to say. Anyone else who had ever said anything like that, they got killed right away. Boom, stamped out just like a bug. But because of the space of grace, because they were so preoccupied, they didn't have enough resources to also address what Wycliffe was doing. And he gained some political allies. He was appointed to an influential position as the rector or the top clergyman at a church in Lutterworth. And this is a town that was on a road between London and Oxford, very pivotal city. And people flocked to hear him teach the word from all over. He gained the ally of the king and the queen of England, Richard II, also the Duke of Lancaster, his name was John of Gaunt, Lord Percy, uh, who was the Earl Marshal, 
And this is the fourth trait of those who succeeded, and that is they got protection from a powerful third party. The Pope's hounds were constantly trying to get at Wycliffe, those who could get away from the Babylonian captivity issues and fighting each other. And at times, they latched on him. They almost got him. There were, he, they tried him for heresy once, but the first time, John of Gaunt uh, and Lord Percy confounded the trial with procedural issues and got him off the hook. The second trial, the queen sent a messenger to the trial and scared them so much they let him go. But what was really interesting is every time they touched him, every time they got to him and tried to limit him in some way, Wycliffe counterpunched by doing something even greater. So the first thing they did is succeeded in getting him dismissed from his teaching position at Oxford. But then you know what he did? He went out and taught the people. Oh, no. And then it got even worse. You know, instead of limiting, and now he had all kinds of people that were blessed with what he was saying. And this was the fifth trait of success, and that was that the word was made known to the common man. And then, later on, they got him kicked out from his position at Lutterworth, where he was the top clergyman. But then, you know what Wycliffe did? He upped the ante. He translated the Bible from the Latin Vulgate into English. Oh, no! And see, this was, now this is Middle English. I don't know whether in high school you read the works of Chaucer at all, but it, it's really strange sounding English. You can sort of see it in there. But if you look on page 62, here is a, uh, John 3.16. For so the God, so lewd, loved, the, the U is a V, the world that he gaff, his own begotten son, you have to read it with an accent, I guess, a Cockney accent. That etch man that believeth in him should perish not, but have everlasting life. Isn't that great? <laughs> I don't know if I was very good with the accent. But the people just, they loved it. They had the word in their own language. It wasn't in code. It was something that they could take and read. Now, of course, printing had not yet been invented. So they copied these by hand. Then he had two assistants, John Purvey and Nicholas Hereford who translated the Old Testament, and the whole Bible was available in English for people to read, and it just, it revolutionized England. Once they had that, no one was going to take it away. And a lot of changes were happening at the time. The feudal system was coming to an end. There was all the uncertainty with the Hundred Years' War, and this Bible being available in their language blessed them so much. It gave them so much hope. The Roman church, they burned every copy they found. And it took months to make one by hand. But thousands of copies were made. John Wycliffe started the Lollard movement, which were lay preachers, untrained people who didn't go to seminary, who just came to fellowship and just loved to hear the word so much. It changed their lives so much that they dedicated their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ and started teaching the word. And they just went everywhere teaching the word in England in the 1300s. Wow. Some of the things that Wycliffe taught. The literal meaning is to be sought over the figurative meaning. Holy Scripture is all the truth. One part of Scripture explains another. The Holy Bible is free from all error and contradiction. The Scriptures are the absolute authority for truth, not papal degree or tradition. The Pope is Antichrist, the proud worldly priest of Rome, and the most cursed of clippers and purse carvers. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the mediator between God and man, not the Pope. All philosophy and law and logic and all ethics are in Holy Scripture. Trust wholly in Christ, rely altogether on his sufferings, beware of seeking to be justified in any other way than by his righteousness. Faith in our Lord Jesus Christ is sufficient for salvation. Wow. Luther rediscovered that 100 years, 150 years later. Here's one. It shall greatly help ye to understand the scriptures if you mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom and with what words and at what time, where, to what intent, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth. They were working the word. They were working the word, and it just changed people's lives. It just blessed them. 
The word was so powerful. And you see, once the Bible was made available in the language of the people, it changed everything. Now, it wasn't until after his death that the Babylonian captivity ended. And even then, the, the Lollard movement had grown so strong, and King Richard was still in favor of all that, that even after the Babylonian captivity was over, they couldn't change it. They couldn't stop it. Wycliffe lived until 1384. 41 years after he died, the Roman Catholics finally had enough power in England to dig up his bones, try him after his death for a heretic, and burnt his bones, and then scattered them in a little brook nearby called the Swift, which was a tributary of the Avon River. But Wycliffe himself had lit another fire that would never be quenched. Here's a quote from one of the church historians. It says, they burnt his bones to ashes and cast them into the swift, a neighboring brook running hard by. Thus the brook thus hath conveyed his ashes into Avon and Avon into Severn and Severn into the narrow seas and they into the main ocean. And thus the ashes of Wycliffe are the emblem of his doctrine, which is now dispersed the world over. Isn't that amazing? Now, the next hero is John Huss. He lived 100 years before Luther. And John Huss and Wycliffe are connected because King Richard's wife was Queen Anne. She was the daughter of the king of Bohemia, or modern-day Czechoslovakia. And when she came over from Europe to become betrothed to Richard, she brought an entourage with her. And among these people was a gentleman named Professor Falfash. And Professor Falfash got turned on to the word. He heard Wycliffe teach, and he got Wycliffe's books, and he realized that Wycliffe was right. And so when Falfash went back to Czechoslovakia, he took Wycliffe's books with him, and he began to teach in Prague. And of course, the Roman Catholics just freaked out when they heard all this stuff. And so there was a young priest by the name of John Huss who decided that he was going to fight Falfash. He was going to fight and ref refute Wycliffe's teachings. But the more that John Huss heard and the more that he read, the more he realized they were right. What a testament to his character. He was hungry. He wanted to be right. He thought he was right. But then when he found out what, what Wycliffe had taught and what Walfash was teaching, he got convinced that they were right. And he made a 180 degree turnabout and began teaching what Wycliffe taught. And he taught it with great zeal. It was like a lightning bolt to the Roman Catholics that here was this, this one champion that they had sent in and he was converted. <laughs> he taught the people and the people were just so thrilled again when the word was made available to them because he translated Wycliffe's books into the Czech language and also translated portions of the Bible and the word spread like wildfire. They taught, we don't confess our sins to men but to God. They said the priests and the friars and the bishops should be holy. There should be separation between church and state. Isn't that something? Because at that time they were all, you know, they had official religions in each country and they were enforced by law. So if you went against the church, then they would sick the army on you, the police on you, because they were all connected with government. Now at this time, with John Huss, the Babylonian captivity was still ongoing, so there were many ingredients of a successful emergence. The word was made known to the common people, there was a hungry heart, there was light from God's word, but there wasn't as much of a space of grace because the Roman Catholic Babylonian captivity was coming to an end. They did a, a big conference when it came to an end to try to solve all the wounds and heal everything up. John Huss went to that conference and he had an order of protection from the Holy Roman Emperor. But when he got there, they arrested him and they said, we're more powerful than the Holy Roman Emperor. He was convicted in a mock trial. The first day of the trial was a solar eclipse. And everybody, oh, no, what's happening? But they still went through with it and had this kangaroo court. And they condemned him as a heretic. And he was burned at the stake. 
And his last words, while he was tied to the stake with firewood stacked to his chin, they asked him, are you willing to recant? He said, I am nothing tempted to gainsay what I have advanced. I have taught the truth, and now I am ready to seal it with my blood. Ultimately, it shall prevail, though I may not see it. This day you kindle the flames of persecution about a poor and worthless sinner, but the spirit which animates me shall, like the phoenix, ascend from my ashes and soar majestically on high through many succeeding ages and prove to all the Christian world how vain this persecution and how impotent your rage. <laughs> and then they lit the fire and John Huss died singing from the midst of the flames. Incredible. Just incredible. That angered the people of Czechoslovakia so much they revolted, and two years later, you couldn't find a Roman Catholic in the country. They just kicked everybody out. It was incredible. It was just unbelievable. And, and so the Pope said to the Ro Holy Roman Emperor, you've got to stamp this out. And so they sent armies from Poland and from Germany and from all over into Czechoslovakia to try to stamp this out. But the believers fought like crazy. They fought like lions. And they, they would have communion before the battle, and they'd sing hymns, and then they would fight like Samson's. The commander was John D. Trosnikow, and he was nicknamed Ziska, which means one eye, because he had one eye, and he used really inspired tactics to fight these armies. And they the odds were really against them, three or four or five to one. And still, Ziska, good old one eye, and his armies defeated all these other people who were trying to punish them for being believers. In one of the battles, his one good eye was hit with an arrow, and he still stayed on his post, and he led the battle blind. <laughs> Just so inspiring. However, what happened is the Czechoslovakian be believers were in two factions. One was more liberal, liberal and one was more conservative. And after a while, instead of allying with each other, they started contending with each other. And because of that, the Roman Catholics could get some inroads. And pretty soon, they crushed them and brutally re-Catholicized the whole country. Really vicious what they did. In Fox's Book of Martyrs, he has quotes of 20 of the Protestant sympathizers that were sentenced to death in Prague just for being believers. And they were tortured and they were beheaded, but before they died, they had a chance to say something. Lord Schislick said, I have God's favor, which is sufficient to inspire anyone with courage. The fear of death does not trouble me. Uh, Lord Viscount Winselos said, the Lord hath given, the Lord hath taken away. Greater honor now attends me, a crown of martyrdom is my portion. Lord Harriet said, Almighty God, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These were their last words. Lord Henry Otto, I feel my spirits revive. God be praised for affording me such comfort. Earl of Ruginia, I am better pleased at the sentence of death than if the emperor himself had given me life, for I find that it pleases God to have his truth defended, not by our swords, but by our blood. Sir Gaspar Kaplitz, God reserved me until these years to be a spectacle to the world and a sacrifice to himself. I will ask pardon of God, whom I frequently offended, but not of the emperor, whom I never gave any offense. Dionysius Servius, they may destroy my body, body, but they cannot injure my soul. That I commend to my Redeemer. Tobias Steflik, I have received during the whole course of my life many favors from God, Ought I not therefore cheerfully take this one bitter cup? Christopher Chober, I come in the name of God to die for his glory. I have fought the good fight, finished my course. So executioner, do your duty. John Schultes, the righteous seem to die in the eyes of fools, but they only go to rest. Lord Jesus, behold, I'm come. Look upon me, pity me, pardon my sins, and receive my soul. John Kuttenauer, to the priest that was trying to get him to recant, 
Your superstitious faith I abhor, it leads to perdition, and I wish for no other arms against the terrors of death than a good conscience. Incredible. May our sacrifice be commensurate with theirs. We have to just stand up against some resistance, you know, some people who look at us funny for being believers, who don't like what we say and say bad words about us. They don't cut off our heads. I think we can stand up, don't you? Just incredible. Martin Luther is the next one that I want to talk about. He lived from 1483 to 1546. By the age of 21, he'd earned a master's degree from the University of Erfurt in Germany. And his father wanted him to become a, an attorney. But on July the 17th in 1505, soon after a dear friend had died, he was walking outside and almost got struck by lightning. And he was so terrified that he vowed that if he survived that he'd become a monk. And so he did, much to his father's chagrin. However, that law training that he had received later on paid off big because Luther could really argue. He could reason his way through an argument and he was not intimidated. And so he joined the Augustinian order of monks, but he had a problem in that he became extremely sin conscious and insecure, even to the extent of persecuting himself, beating himself. He would go outside in the middle of winter and lay on the ground in the snow in the dead of winter and, and until his fellow monks would carry him back into the monastery because he, he, he had such a low opinion of himself. And this behavior got the attention of the head of the monastery. His name was John von Stolpes. And so he tried to get Martin Luther to stop doing these things and just simply love God. But Luther said, I hate God. And that actually added to the depths of his despair because he, he couldn't identify, he couldn't, because he thought God was the righteous judge and he could never rise up to what he was expected to do. And so, uh, the, John von Stoppitz, the, uh, the leader of the monastery, he tried several things to try to get Luther out of his funk. First thing he did is he, he got him to teach the Bible, thinking that the Word would help him. And later on, he encouraged him to get his doctors in theology, hoping that he'd get so busy in his studies that he wouldn't have time to be so introspective. Then, he even send him to Rome on a special trip on behalf of the monastery because when you went to Rome, you could do all of these things that would shorten your life in purgatory, supposedly. You go through all these rituals and uh, you could pass go and get $200, you know, whatever. And so anyway, but when Luther got there, he saw the, the hypocrisy and the flippancy of the Roman pastors and bishops and monks and that just hit him in the heart and cut him to the bone. Because, you know, he, he was serious about this, and all these other guys, they were just making it into his big game and taking advantage of people and doing whatever they wanted. So when he got home, he was more troubled than ever. But pretty soon, the studying the Word started to take root. It started to have some success. And so there is the hungry heart. And he became a priest at the local church, and he taught the word on the level of the people because he had gone through all of this depression and all of this stuff, and he was able to identify when people had problems. It wasn't like he was condescending and talking to them like that. He was talking to them on their level, and the people really were blessed by what he was teaching them. But finally, in 1515, he had his breakthrough, and he has a quote in here where he recounts the story where he finally understood Romans 1.17. He says, Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners and secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmured greatly. I was angry with God. 
and said, as if indeed it's not enough that miserable sinners eternally lost through original sin are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Ten Commandments without having God add pain to pain by the gospel and also by the gospel threatening us with his righteousness and wrath. Boy, he had his head on backwards, didn't he? Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat opportunely upon Paul at that place, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted in the book of Romans. And at last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words, namely, in it the righteousness of God is revealed, as it is written, he through faith is righteous shall live. There I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives, by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, namely the passive righteousness. That, that's that inherent right, the sonship right, which merciful God justifies us by faith as it is written, he through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise itself through open gates, there a totally other face of the entire scripture showed itself to me. Thereupon I ran through the scripture from memory. I also found in other terms an analogy as the work of God, that is what God does in us, the power of God with which he makes us wise, the strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. It changed his life. Just Romans 1.17. Once he understood it, and then he loved God as much as he used to hate him. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. That's a key. That's what keys do. They totally change people's lives. See, before this time, the Roman Catholic Church had taught that salvation was by works, not by grace. And so Wycliffe had also taught justification by grace, but that teaching had been rehidden. And so now he took solace in God's grace and love, and the whole world and the Bible became totally new. Everything that he had learned got reshuffled into new sequence, into accurate sequence, and it fit. So he started teaching it, and it just blessed so many people because they had been oppressed by all of this stuff. And so he, he, he faithfully ministered to his congregation. And see, you know, the plague would go in waves around Europe. And there was one time in 1516, a wave of the plague hit Wittenberg where he was. And you know what he did? Even though his fellow monks and everyone were encouraging him to uh, withdraw, he kept ministering to his people. That's just amazing. Uh, now, at that time, the Roman Catholic Pope decided to build St. Peter's Basilica. And it was so expensive in $1,500 that it would be equivalent to sending a man to the moon. It would be just as expensive as sending a man to the moon, that one building. It was so ornate and gaudy, and, and the architecture was so uh, pushing the envelope and everything. It was so expensive, it would be as expensive as a moonshot. And they had to raise money. So they drew up what's, what was called a special indulgence where you could get your grandma out of purgatory by paying money. And so they had salesmen that would go out and sell these, and they'd get a commission. And one of these salesmen was John Tetzel. Uh, he was willing to make any claim that increased sales. He promised special reductions for the punishments of sins. He, he allowed advanced payments for future sins. <laughs> He, could, he even said you could be completely forgiven forever if you paid enough. Uh, he also claimed that uh, indulgences would shorten the life, uh, the, the time that deceased relatives spent in purgatory, and he even used a jingle to boost sales. And it was, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. <laughs> and uh, he started, his, his, that poison started affecting Luther's congregation. And so Luther stood up and was fed up with it finally. And so on October 31st in 1517, he posted 95 objections, 95 theses to indulgences. 
Now, he didn't intend to split the church. He didn't intend, intend to be iconoclastic. You know, he pounded this thing on the door of the church. It wasn't like he was trying to say anything because that was the bulletin board. And all he was doing is putting up a, up a notice that he wanted to debate these. But it was at the right place at the right time. Printing had been recently invented, and someone copied down this list and took it to a printer. And the printer wanted to make money, so he printed tons of these things, and they went all over Europe like wildfire. And pretty soon, all of Europe was in a tussle, uh, was just in a tussle over this. And uh, it was just unbelievable. But there was a space of grace because Frederick the Wise, who was the Duke of Saxony, supported Luther. And so the Roman Catholic Church challenged him. And of course, things at that time didn't proceed at the fast pace that they do now with our communications and instantaneous things. You know, it took a couple years for everything to come to a head. And so uh, Luther kept on teaching. And see, Luther was a character. Uh, he loved to go down to the bar. He liked German beer. Uh, he said that if you can't laugh in heaven, I don't want to go. He had a real sharp tongue from his, uh, his training as, a, uh, as an attorney, so he could argue with anyone and not be intimidated. But he was very blunt. He was almost crass how he talked. And, he, you know, he talked like a farmer. And the people just loved him because he taught on their level. He, his favorite expression was, tell the devil he can kiss my ass. <laughs> Isn't that something? He was just a great character. But he taught the word, and the people loved him, and he taught salvation by faith and not by works, and that led to a seismic shift. Um, his most revolutionary idea was regarding the freedom that we got when we were justified by faith. And that translated later into political freedom. And it, was a, it led to a seismic shift in Europe in the power structures. He said, a Christian man is the most free lord of all and subject to nobody. Then he said, a Christian man is the most dutiful servant of all and subject to everyone. We can get that, can't we? So anyway, things came to a head later on at the Diet of Worms. It looks like Diet of Worms, but it's not. It's the Diet of Worms. And there, they were convened to get to Luther and deal with his heresies, because the Roman Catholic uh, Pope had excommunicated Luther, and Luther had burned all of the Pope's books in and the, and the papal letter. The, they called the letter from the Pope a bull, and it was a bunch of bull. <laughs> but he burned that. Here at this Diet of Worms, there were three factions. They had, Luther's allies were there, led by Frederick the Wise. Uh, friends of Erasmus were there, and they wanted to they wanted the, the middle ground, because that's how Erasmus was. They wanted to work out some kind of a compromise if Luther could make some concessions. And then the papists were there from the pope, and they wanted to push the Roman emperor to get Luther executed. But, of course, Frederick the Wise was there with his allies politically to protect him. When Luther went there, he went there like a rock star. All the people were just, there he is, and they had crowds, and he came in like a conqueror. And then when he got into the council, he came expecting to debate. But when he got there, they had this table laid out with all of his books. And there was an orator there who was one of his opponents, and he said, do you confess that these books are yours? And will you retract and renounce the contents of the same? And so, you know, he didn't know what to do. But since he had the law training, instead of being intimidated and letting them go with, through with what they wanted to do, he said, well, look, I, I need some time. I need to think this over. So, you know, give me 24 hours so I can think this over. And so they gave him 24 hours. And so on the second day of the trial, they said, do you regard all these books as yours or do you want to retract something? And so he said that um, 
my books, and this is, you can see his law training. He said, my books are not all the same type because in some of them, I handle the word and morals so directly and evangelically that even my opponents are forced to admit that those books are useful, blameless, etc. And if I were to retract those, how could I retract the truth? And then there's another kind of my books, which attacks the Pope and the doctrine of the Papists. And he said, nobody can deny that they have done so much damage entrapped and harassed and tortured people, that if I retracted those, I would offer nothing else than that I would increase the strength of the tyranny. And if I covered them, oh, how great a cover for wickedness and tyranny I would be. Then he said, there's a third type of books that I wrote against some individuals and against those who naturally endeavored to defend the Roman tyranny and destroy the piety taught by me. And against those, I admit, I admit that I was harsher than is fitting for religion or profession. And what he meant was, see, he had a real sharp tongue. And he would say things in German about the Pope and about indulgences and about all these, these hip, hypocrites. But he would say them in such biting and funny ways in German that it used to send the people that heard it into fits of laughter. They thought it was so funny what he would say. And it was so cutting and so piercing. And so he's talking about this third group there. But he said, nor is it honest for me to retract those because by this retraction, it would again happen that tyranny and impiety would reign by my patronage and rage more violently against the people of God than they ever reigned. So finally, the orator said, well, I don't want a long answer. I want a simple, concise answer. So Luther said, all right. And this is the famous thing that he said. Since your most serene majesty and your power seek a simple answer, I'll give it to you. And I'm not going to be sophistical nor pointed in any way unless I shall be refuted by the testimonies of the scriptures or by evident reason. For I believe neither in pope nor in councils alone since it is agreed that they have rather frequently erred and have contradicted themselves. I am defeated by the writings prompted by me, and my conscience is captive to the words of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything, for to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do nothing else. God help me. Amen. Right in the king's face. What courage. He even said to his friends after that, he said, I'm, I'm done, I'm finished. They're going to kill me. You know, they're going to roast me alive. But because of Frederick the Wise, the King Charles of uh, the Roman Hol Holy Roman Emperor could not decree there in public that he would be executed. So he just said, look, if anybody can get to him and kill him, then we'll let him do that. And so what happened is... Um, Frederick the Wise and his, his uh, compatriots figured out how to circumvent this. So what they did is when Luther was on his way back home, they kidnapped him and made it look like somebody was carrying out King Charles' decree that anyone could kill him if they could get to him. And so they spirited him away to this castle and, he, and hid him there for six months. And Luther grew a beard and changed his name. He became a Knight George. <laughs> But while he was there in seclusion, he did the unthinkable. He translated the Bible into German. And he did such a wonderful job of doing it that it became the standard for the German language in grammar and spelling. Everybody read the word so much that it controlled how they talked, it controlled how they spelt things, it controlled the grammar. It was such an influ influential work. Uh, the Old Testament was, uh, New Testament was finished in 1522. The Old was finished later in 1534. That just totally changed stuff. Uh, his theological movement, though, took on a life of its own because of the freedoms the people received. And pretty soon there was the Peasant Revolution where they revolted against um, the Holy Roman Emperor and against the, the local uh, dukes that were in charge of various areas. And that caught Luther in between. 
because his protectors were those very same dukes. So he could not conscience the violence. He was more conservative. He could not conscience the violence that they were uh, doing. And so he backed the dukes. And uh, so he, he pretty soon the, the, the revolution ended and the people, some of them were kind of miffed at Luther because they expected him to support them, but you know, he didn't support what they did. But, uh, and, and then Luther got married, as well as almost all of the other priests that were former priests in Germany, they changed to Lutheranism and they got married. And Erasmus quipped, he said, what started out as a tragedy turned into a comedy with everyone getting married and living happily ever after. <laughs> the next one I want to talk about is William Tyndall. He was in England. William Tyndall translated the Bible into modern English. Uh, he was a brilliant scholar. He was able to speak seven languages. He was influenced by Erasmus, who said the Bible should be translated into the vernacular so that the plowboy and the simplest woman can understand it. Uh, Luther also inspired him. Uh, and he was very much in, fe in favor of teaching the word in English. Of course, that was very controversial in England. And he debated it. Um, at that time, the only language the Bible was in and the services were in were in Latin. And so he one day had an argument with a local friar in England and he exclaimed, if God spare my life ere many years, I'll cause a boy that drives the plow to know more scriptures than you do. <laughs> and he did it. Uh, the priest started accusing him of, of heresy, and he tried to go to London to get the, the, uh, the backing of some of the influential people there. But and he wanted, you know, he tried to get the, some backing to translate the Bible into English, but no one dared do it. No printer would dare print it. So finally, he fled to Europe, went and visited Luther, and there uh, in Europe, he traveled from city to city and translated the Bible into English. The New Testament was done in 1522, and so by 1525, well, he finished in 1525, put it that way. A printer in Cologne, Germany, was printing it, but then a spy from the Roman Catholic Church found out and snuck in and almost had all of it confiscated. But Tyndale and his assistant grabbed all the printed sheets and escaped to another town and finished it in Worms that same year. And then his New Testament was smuggled back into England, and they, they, they smuggled it in bags of grain and other things like that. And whenever one of his Bibles was discovered by the Roman Catholics, they just went nuts, and they destroyed them, they burned them. But the people loved it so much. There was so much hunger for the word in their language. The priests really hated it because Tyndale's translation didn't have the word purgatory in it. And purgatory was a real lever that the, the priests held over the heads of the people to try to get them to kowtow to what they said. They said, you're going to fry in purgatory for millions of years and never go to heaven, you know, and all this other stuff. And also the indulgences, they would pay money to get them out of purgatory. And so his translation of the Bible didn't even have that word in it. And so it, it eroded their power over the people, you understand? Tyndale ended up in Antwerp, Belgium, at, which at that time was another free city, not as controlled by the Roman Catholics. There was a merchant there uh, that was selling his books, and a, a, and a bishop from England approached this merchant and said, hey, hey, I hear you have a whole bunch of Tyndall's books. And he said, yeah. And so this bishop from England said, well, here, I, I want to buy them all so I can burn them. So we, he won't have any more Bibles. And so the merchant told Tyndall what was happening. And so they conferred, and so they sold the bishop all these Bibles. But see, this was the first printing that had all the errors in it. And so they had already gone through it and found the corrections. And so they used the money from that bishop to refinance the printing of a new version that was better. And so pretty soon, there were more Bibles all over the place, and they were better. <laughs> 
there were 18,000 copies of his Bible printed in 40 different printings. There are only three that exist today. All the rest were either burnt for, by people who hated them or they were read to pieces by people who loved them. But they were unable to stop it. One time he lost, when he was doing the Old Testament, he was shipwrecked and he lost all of his printing and had to start all over again. But Tyndale was not just an intellectual geek. He wasn't just a scholar. He wisely tempered his intellectual activities with service. He got his hands dirty, so to speak. Because he did that, it enabled him to be able to frame the concepts of the word into every man's English. That's what made it so approachable. Yet he was a scholar, and he could couch these terms in such lofty and beautiful ways. He was just a genius. While he was in Antwerp, he gave himself to do good works because he said, my part be not in Christ if my heart not be to follow and live according as I teach. So on Mondays, he visited other, other religious refugees from England. On Saturdays, he walked the streets in Antwerp and ministered to the poor. On Sundays, he dined in merchants' homes, reading the scriptures to them before and after dinner. And then the rest of the week, he worked on his translations. Uh, he dedicated his life. He never got married. But he didn't have that much of a space of grace because he had to flee from one city to another to another because King Henry VIII wanted him arrested at all costs. And he sent agents all over Europe looking for him. And Tyndale made the mistake of staying too long in one place in Antwerp. And somebody betrayed him, and he was arrested in 1534. He was jailed for 15 months. And then, alas, this hero of the Bible was executed, strangled, and then burnt at the stake. His last words were, Lord, open the king of England's eyes. Incredibly, that prayer was answered less than two years later. King Henry VIII had wanted a divorce from Anne Boleyn, and the Roman Catholic Church wouldn't give it to him. And so King Henry VIII seceded from the Roman Catholic Church and started his own church and got people in the church to allow him to divorce Anne Boleyn and get married because he, he didn't have any sons. And finally, the woman that he married gave him a son. And the new church needed a translation of the Bible because they didn't want the Latin Vulgate. So two years later, he legalized the Bible in English. Now, why am I going through all of this history for you? Because the first century church didn't earnestly contend enough for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And so, so many died because of that. And they were crushed just, with a, just a, with a tiny scrap of what we know now. We owe our lives. We owe our light. We owe our freedom. We owe our joy to them. How can we honor their sacrifice? How can we be worthy of it? By standing on their light from the word and living their dream. That's how. Bless you.